Hello all and welcome to this meeting of the Tortured Poets Department. My name is Vera and I will be your leader today in analyzing the new album by Taylor Swift. In this video I will be going through the Tortured Poets Department song by song, telling you what I think about it. Um, of course this is just day one so it's gonna be my initial thoughts reactions. Um, I highlighted some quotes that I think are very interesting and some motifs that I will then later tie all together because then at the end I will be presenting these five lenses that I think it's interesting to analyze the album through and because this is primarily a book channel so if you're interested in reading a Taylor Swift subscribe and so I'll be giving a book recommendation based on each of these interpretations and if you have any thoughts on whatever I say do let me know in the comments below Track one is po Fortnite featuring Post Malone. Uh, this is a very interesting track. I wouldn't have picked it, I think, for the single of the album. So I'm very, very interested in what the visual is going to be. And it looks amazing. Um, I was silly and I thought that the visual was releasing at 1 my time, uh, like 1 p.m. It is, in fact, 1 a.m. So I was wrong and I don't have a visual yet which is very annoying. We also don't have any lyrical videos as of now, so hopefully that's changed by the time I'm editing this. Um, but so if I get any of the lyrics a little bit wrong, do let me know. What can I say about this track? It is very interesting because it, in my opinion, introduces us to Taylor's basically whole situation that she explores uh, in the later tracks. She opens up by talking about like a previous love she starts off by telling us about a relationship that left her being a functioning alcoholic and she's saying that and even though she says that she hopes that her partner is okay she does she does also put the blame on him but then interestingly enough the next verse i think seems to move on to a different person um because now she says that she's taking a miracle like get well soon drug or get love quick drug i think that's what it I think that's what it was. Also, Post Malone's part goes so hard at the end of the song. Loved it. Moving on to the titular track. It has some lyrics that I thought were a little bit questionable, like the golden, the tattooed golden retriever. <laughs> what was going on with that? But I love the opening where she says, um, oh, you brought your typewriter from the tortured poets department. And I'm thinking Hugh uses typewriters anyway. I, I just thought that was so funny and so quintessentially um, Taylor Swift. The fact that she is name dropping people in her and her partner's life, uh, Lucy and Jack, didn't see that coming. I'm not 100% sure who Lucy is, but Jack is obviously Jack Antonoff. Um, I think it might be Lucy from Boy Genius, but I'm not sure. Sonically though, the song isn't my favorite, but there are a few nuggets that I'll get into in my analysis later on. Then we get to my first supermodel, which is my boy only braces favorite toys. When I heard this, it just, when the beat comes in, da 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 boom. Mm. I knew that I would love it. I think the song is so interesting because it uses this image of a doll, an army doll, fighting in only your army front lines. She uses this metaphor of I'm the doll and you came, you took me out of my box, you played with me, and you told me I'm better, but I'm not. And the melody here is so amazing. I... Mm, the lyrics themselves are also so crazy. Um, the fact that she says, my boy only breaks his favorite toys. I'm queen of sand castles he destroys. Oh, gorgeous. Because on one hand, she's saying, this thing was juvenile. We didn't get come into this as seriously as, we didn't treat this as seriously as we should have. We were just children. We were playing in the sand pit. Also, sand castles crumble very, very easily. So... She's telling us, not only were we children, we also built something that would fall apart very, very easily. And then she's quite literally telling us, you are breaking this. So I just I just love how it's just two lines, but they tell us so much. Um, it's also so vivid uh, earlier when she talks about rivulets, uh, like destroying her smile. And that's beautiful. Uh, and that's just a beautiful way of saying, I'm crying so hard, it's like just ruining my face, you know, it's ruining my smile. It's carving into the plastic. Next we have Down Bad, and it took me a few listens to really 
enjoy this song because for some reason it just didn't click for me and but it has now. I honestly didn't anticipate that she would be using this idea of I was heaven struck, uh, this was cosmic love, and now I'm down bad, bleeding on the ground. I didn't think that that's the way that she would have gone in. And I'm so glad that she did because I didn't see this coming. And also even later when she says, I'm waving at the ship, technically it could be a spaceship. In this one, like a true billionaire, <laughs> Taylor Swift is taking interest in space. <laughs> that was a joke. And while I was watching Zach, Zach's video, I uh, he said something that like gave me the idea of this kind of reminds me of Slaughterhouse Five, um, because the main character is like displaced from the world by aliens, and then when he comes back, uh, he's so unstuck in time, and he just can't, and he ve feels very lost, and useless and some people have interpreted that as a metaphor for PTSD and depression and I have and so I I don't know if she would have used that as an inspiration for the song but I just thought the parallel was interesting. So Long London the intro beautiful 10 out of 10 and, if you, and it's so visual as well not only just like with the descriptions that she's using which are amazing but also sonically i feel like i feel like the way she sings and the way that it's produced just work very well together to give this very um dark misty depressing kind of angry sound and vibe that she's going for a lyric that really messed me up was when she said, you swore that you loved me, but where were the clues? I died on the altar waiting for the proof. You sacrificed us to the gods of your bluest days and I'm just getting color back into my face. I'm just mad as hell because I loved this place for so long London. I'll dig into so long London a bit later on in my uh, analysis. So I'll move on to the next song, which is, but daddy, I love him and I adore this song. I think it's my number two right now on the record. And man, I'm interested if the song will cause controversy. Because it's crazy. It's crazy. I wasn't like understanding what she was saying until the very end when she's like, I'm gonna have his babies. No, I'm not. I was like, girl, <laughs> what? And then she's like, you should see your face. And I'm like, yeah, <laughs> yeah, my face is... I'm not comprehending anything that's happening. Also, the way she sings at the end... He was chaos, he was revelry. Mwah. Beautiful chef's kiss. I adore. Maybe my favorite ad lib on this album. And then we have track seven, Fresh Out the Slammer. Uh, a slammer being a jail. He can be my jailer, Burton to this tailor. Gold cage hostage to my feelings. I'm just gonna leave that there. But yeah, in general, the song really is giving me the energy of illicit affairs or Ivy, but in real life. And that kind of makes me wonder about the timeline of some events. But again, I don't really want to like speculate too much. And even though this isn't like my favorite song on the album, there was uh, in the opening a moment that really, really splintered back in winter, silent dinners, bitter, giving me tolerate it, I have to say fights and tunnels handcuffed to the spell I was under for just one hour of sunshine years of labor locks and ceilings in the shade of how he was feeling but it's gonna be all right I did my time and also also to the house where you still wait up and that porch light gleams that is very disturbing to me <laughs> because of the entire debacle of when she mouthed the same thing that a certain person wrapped on his tour um and she mouthed this song is about you, you know who you are, I love you, to Cardigan. And Cardigan has a very important porch light mentioned. And uh, I think Betty also has that same porch light and it's at the same like time. Okay, so it's not at uh, 2.31. I think it would have been too much for my mental health if it was, that would have been so crazy. Then we get to Florida. <laughs> I saw online that some people are mixed on the song. Personally, I love it. I adore it. Um, especially the outro and oh my god, I just really like how Taylor and Florence's voices mix together. I think they suit each other so much. 
but I'm going to skip over it a little bit because then we get to Guilty as Sin. This is my favorite song on the album. I'm obsessed with it. And if you don't mind, I want to do like a lyric by lyric breakdown. Again, like not too deep. These are just like first day thoughts, but oh, I love this song. I love this song. It's mental illness, but it's constructed so beautifully. Okay, so it starts off with drowning in the blue Nile. He sent me downtown lights. I hadn't heard it in a while. Okay, so I'm pretty sure that the 1975 sampled this song. But also just if you look at the song, it's it has like those kind of like undertones of like doing something risque with someone that you probably know you shouldn't be doing. So I find that interesting, but moving on. My boredom's bone deep. This cage was once just fine. And this is why I mentioned the cage earlier, unless I cut it out. And now she's saying this cage was once just fine. Girly, maybe cages aren't great. Maybe we shouldn't cage ourselves. Am I allowed to cry? And the way she delivers this line, and it's so inquisitive at the start, but by the end of the song, it's like she's almost crying. It's, oh, I love it. Anyways, I dream of cracking locks, throwing my lives to the wolves, out of the woods or the ocean rocks stood on the cliffside to sing give me a reason <laughs> crashing into him tonight he's a paradox i'm seeing visions am i bad or mad or wise there's just like this idea of i might do like the stupidest thing but what if it's the correct thing like am i stupid am i like evil for wanting this if you know, like that, ugh, just the not knowing. Oh my God. And then it goes into the chorus. What if he's written mine on my upper thigh only in my mind? Is that okay? This song is not PG-13. Children, don't listen to this, please. Because she's like, on one hand, like, kind of being coy with us. But at the same time, she's like kind of wishing for it. But then she's also feeling guilty for wishing it. And oh, it's just so sexy. What is he writing um, mine with? His hands? His finger? His tongue? I'm slipping, falling back into the hedge maze. Oh, what a way to die. Oh. This brings me back to like the idea of her mind being a labyrinth. Uh, and her just like not knowing what to do. And I think that this kind of gives maybe a bit more context to some songs on Midnight's. I don't, I don't know. I don't know. This is just speculation. Without ever touching his skin, how can I be guilty as sin? I mean, what, what more is there to say? I, yeah, I think it's that like concoction of coy, sexy, um, wistful that just really, I don't know, just does something to my brain. I keep these lungs locked in lowercase inside a vault. Someone told me there's no... S okay, wait, wait, before I move on. Lowercase inside a vault? Again, this brings me back to illicit affairs and Ivy. Are we talking about folklore and evermore vaults and that she wrote songs about longing for this person in 2020? Someone told me there's no such thing as bad thoughts. Only your actions talk. These fatal fantasies, love me some alliteration, fatal fantasies, giving way to labored breathing, taking all of me. We've already done it in my head. If it's make-believe, why does it feel like a vow we'll both uphold somehow? This isn't PG-13. Like, I'm not even monetized, but I'm still censoring myself because, ah. Oh. And then we go back into the chorus but this time she changes it to, my bed sheets are ablaze. I've screamed his name, building up like waves crashing over my grave. Okay, uh, the grave thing. I tie this in one of my analyses, like the fact that like there's so much about like dying and death and graves and especially um, songs like So Long London, later on LOML, later on LOML. I think that they're about the same person um not the same person as the song and so i think 
whenever she signals to us grave holy spirit stuff like that i think she's talking about that person so i think it's very interesting <clears throat> and yet now she's saying like oh like i'm dead this is already like this relationship is already dead and she's signaling to us like that she probably was still with that guy so there's this thing that authors use sometimes and it's called this embedded narrative and it's basically where you have a story you stop it to tell another story and then you pick up that story again at the very end and i'm not saying this is exactly what it is but it kind of is similar to it um because we start off the song with her just kind of telling the backstory of this person sending her this song and then we stop and then the entire rest of the song until this outro is her think of thinking and telling us of all the things that she'd love to do with this person and her uh, questioning if it's morally correct even if it would be personally correct for her and her mental wealth well-being and then that embedded narrative kind of finishes and then we go back to that scene of her listening to the song and thinking to herself once again at all of this because she's just so overwhelmed by everything am i allowed to cry i adore this song it is my favorite i think it is so well constructed moving on we have who's afraid of little old me I wish the song took off a little bit more, but I do really like the screaming part. And I do really like the lines of, so I leap from the gallows and I levitate down on your street, crash the party like a record scratch as I scream. Who's afraid of little old me? You should be. Then we get to, I can fix him. No, really, I can. I think the song is so tongue in cheek. Um, I'm obsessed with, everything that she says here uh i do like the cowboy kind of thing mabob going on kind of ties into cowboy like me uh sonically so yeah and then at the end how she's like whoa maybe i can't she's funny moving on to loml i mentioned this already earlier unless i cut it from the video but never uh, she says some like crazy things here um about like this lover being like a holy ghost, the love not being quite buried, fake heavens, how she's never felt this way before and probably won't feel the same ever since. It's just a very sad song. And to be honest, when the Tortured Poets Department was announced, I think all of us had a certain person in mind and we thought that the album would be about him. And at least upon like my first few listens of the song of the songs, I really don't think a lot of the album is about him and the parts that are are mostly very kind like no matter what she says like in the end she's like i'm thankful that this happened and like yeah you broke me we let this go on for way too long uh you weren't going to finish it i was trying way too hard to keep it alive when i should have just let it fizzle out are our phantoms sec are our dancing phantoms on the terrace secondhand embarrassed? I don't know. Mr. Seal, your girl, then make her cry, said I'm the love of your life. But in the end, she says that I'm the loss of your life, uh, or you're the loss of my life. And that's just so sad. And now we get to I Can Do It With A Broken Heart, and I know that I'll be crucified for this. I listened to the song twice. I don't think I can listen to it again. I just, the da 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 kind of energy just doesn't, um, I like the element where it's like as if she's in rehearsal for the Eras tour and uh, she has like her choreographer or whatever shouting for her to like keep going and stuff like that. I, I love that part of the production. I don't like anything else about it. Uh, and the lyrics as well, just, I'm a really tough kid. I can handle my sh um bit something camera smile da -da -ba 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 -ba. Uh, mm -mm. no i'm so depressed but i'm so productive it's an art you can do it with a broken heart like oh, oh. yeah i mm, i really hope this isn't a single and already like two of my friends said that they really enjoy it so i'm probably gonna be the odd one out here but 
uh, that's my skip I'm sorry I think it's like my first skip on the album though but I just um it's, it's going into the category of I physically cannot listen to the song then we get to the smallest man who ever lived which is another mental illness song if someone wrote a song like this about me I'd never show my face in public ever <laughs> um she also says kind of referencing back to guilty as sin and like yes I'm obsessed about the song I'll bring it up whenever I can um she says it wasn't sexy once it wasn't forbidden I also don't think she's hiding who this is about because she says and I don't even want you back I just want to know if my if rusting my sparkling summer was the goal the penultimate track, The Alchemy, is so cute. I talk about this later, but it gives this very beautiful conclusion to this motif of running because um, throughout the album, we see uh, people running uh, away from Taylor, uh, Taylor running for people, but here it ends with a man and running to her. Again, it's not my favorite song on the album, but it is definitely one that I'll be coming back to. Okay, and now we get to Clara Bow, the closer of the original. I think it is interesting lyrics wise because I think for the first time we see her put herself at the level of legends uh, like like Stevie Nicks and Clara Bow. Um, whereas otherwise when she sang about Rebecca Harkness and the lucky one, she doesn't, she always says it's like me versus them or like it's their story and then she flips it oh and then i come into the story to like fill in the shoes but here she's already putting herself at the level of these legends so i think that's very interesting i don't know if it was necessary as a closer especially now that we know that it's a double it's a double album i think the alchemy was would have been a really nice closer um but i'm not mad about it like I think Clarabo is a fine closer as well, just, I don't know, I feel like the alchemy would have just kind of, kind of closed everything up a bit more, th in a more maybe thematically coherent way. I wonder if Clarabo has a place somewhere after But Daddy I Love Him. Okay, so now let's move on to my analyses. Also, little disclaimer that, of course, everything I say is alleged. I obviously don't know, and I'm sure that there will be other breakdowns that are way more knowledgeable than this one. But this, these are just like my first initial day thoughts, and I just want to have someone to discuss them with. So, getting that out of the way. The album opens us with Taylor telling us a story of a fleeting romance that perhaps had a bittersweet ending. She describes what I see as two relationships. To the first one, she assigns the blame for her most recent functioning alcoholism. And the second she describes as a miracle move on drug whose effects were temporary. It appears to me that most of the song focuses on the second love affair and how it lasted for the only for the titular fortnight. This opening track also sets the scene for the interplay of these two love affairs, which are further explored in the other later tracks. That being said, she ends the song by saying that she lost another fortnight in America, which I find very interesting because along with the melancholic tone of the song and the fact that she uses the passive voice, it makes it seem like our chairman of the tortured poets department is wandering aimlessly, at least through her love life. On the titular track, we learn that she does want marriage. And despite her and her lover confessing to both of their friends that they would die for each other if the other person left, she still is wondering who's gonna hold you, touch you, decode you, like me. It's almost as if she has this fear that it just won't be enough. And spoiler, by the way, at the end of the album, we do find out that it wasn't. This impermanence of these intense emotions that she's feeling is often seen throughout the album as this motif of running. And a motif is basically this like reoccurring image or a theme that just shows up many times in a work of art. The chairman believes that her partner, the first one, runs from her because he loves her in the third song. And by the end of the fifth song, where uh, the relationship is already over, she says that they've had a good run. But when it comes to lover number two, she is the one running this time. She's running and screaming, but daddy, I love him, when she's fresh out the slammer and calling this person. She's running to that person. Curiously, 
The final time that this motif of running is seen in the album is on the track The Alchemy. And this time, she seemingly is describing a third person that she hasn't talked about before. And she's saying that this person celebrates his victories, quote, just running over to her. And I think that's very cute. Now, onto the recommendation. Since this is the Tortured Poets Department, I think that it's only appropriate that the first person that I'm recommending to you is William Shakespeare and more specifically his A Midsummer Night's Dream. Now, don't get too scared by the name Shakespeare. In my opinion, A Midsummer Night's Dream is a very good place to start with him because it isn't too difficult to read and I genuinely laughed out loud while reading some of the scenes. And also there's just loads of resources online for this one. We follow these four lovers, uh, Hermia, Helena, Demetrius, and Lysander. And we follow them as they run away to this forbidden forest, which is ruled by fairies. And they get trapped in these magical spells set by Puck, who is a sprite. And it leads them to them kind of questioning their emotions for each other. In fact, now that I think about it, Midsummer Night's Dream truly is mostly people chasing each other or running away from someone. Fits the motif. <laughs> Anyways, similarly to TTPD, Melancholia births intense love affairs that leave our cast questioning were their emotions real when the magic wears off. So if you want to experience a classical poet, who I think in this case is quite easy to read or not as difficult as his other work, and it has the same theme that opens the Tortured Poets department, but it's way less depressing because it's a comedy in this case, then I'd recommend A Midsummer Night's Dream. So long London, we had a good run, a moment of warm sun. So long London, stitches undone, two graves, one gun, you will find someone. That is the bittersweet ending to track five. Taylor tells us that her relationship is over, but that it was beautiful. She references the myth of Sisyphus in the opening describing how her spine split from carrying them, the relationship, up the hill, wet through her clothes, weary bones got the chill and she's describing how it made her sick. And that's interesting because it kind of ties into you're losing me where she says, my face was gray, but you wouldn't admit that we were sick. Here, she's telling us that she got metaphorically sick because she was putting all this work and not really receiving anything back. And this led to the death of the relationship. Still though, she seems to wish her ex-partner well, telling him that he will find someone. And as we presumably learn later on in the album, so does she. One of the locations in the song that I think is quite important because we do revisit it later on is the cemetery. And it seems to be um, this main location that Taylor uses to discuss this relationship and all that it contained, at least on this album. And she uses it to give us more insights to why the relationship fell apart. On LOML, um, what we thought was for all time was momentary, still alive, killing time at the cemetery, never quite buried. And that's right before she declares this um, relationship as the loss of her life, which is an interesting play on L-O-M-L because in reality, loss of my life is the title of the song because she never says you were the love of my life. At least if I remember correctly, she says, I was the love of your life. You are the loss of my life, which is also nice because she's leaving that space open for someone else to come in and be the love of her life. But these vivid descriptions that she uses Expose the human tendency to cling to the fading embers of a love that had already burned itself out. And how difficult it is to let go when it would be easier to fall back into the same old rhythms as she discusses in the start of the song, despite them or the partner not fulfilling her anymore. In the end, the chairman of the tortured poets department comes to the bittersweet conclusion that despite mourning will be difficult, moving on will be for the best. A book that deals with similar issues is you made a fool of death with your beauty. Personally, I would advise you to go into this book knowing as little as possible, other than the fact that it is more so a romance than a deep literary fiction discussing loss and all the stuff I just mentioned, because I felt towards the end that some things could have been handled a little bit dif differently, but it was very clear that the author was trying to write primarily a romance, which is so fine. I just had the wrong expectations going on, but it's still a good book that I think is really relevant to this album. But the general gist of the plot is that we're following this visual artist called Faye, 
and and she's trying to get over the loss of her husband who died a few years prior in a car crash. And similarly to our department head, she feels very lost at the start of the book. And she's like very unwilling to let her heart move on. We follow Faye as she starts opening her heart up and seeing how different people will respond to that. And she's hoping that she'll find someone who does empathize with her experience. And it is a very nice read. It kind of goes crazy at the end and you'll either love it or you won't. But I think it's definitely one that I would love to discuss with people. So I do highly recommend that you read it. Without ever touching his skin, how can she be guilty as sin? Another huge part of TTPD is Taylor fantasizing about a certain someone while perhaps being in a different relationship. These fatal fantasies that she's having, at least as she term as she terms them, have her thinking of him in very sexual manners, as I went through in my a very extensive breakdown of the song because I adore it. But yeah, since I talked about this quite at length and I think that this theme of like her yearning for someone else while being perhaps still in a relationship and having all these thoughts of like, oh, this relationship is killing me, it's already dead, it's dying and there's someone else who's chaos and revelry and I just, I need someone to like take me from here, you know, if I know it's a funny comparison to make but perhaps I need another getaway car. So yeah, I think it's quite evident throughout the album without me having to go too deep into it step by step. Um, so I'll just get right into my recommendation. And the book I'm recommending you is In My Dreams I Hold a Knife. This is such an addicting book, I can't even explain it. First of all, for aesthetic reasons, it matches this because it has this dark academia vibe going for it. But of course, as I said in the start, I don't want to base books simply off of aesthetics. So let me kind of give you more of a backstory of what this book is actually about. We are following um, this group of friends going to Duquette University, which is a very highbrow elite university. And we're following them in two timelines, one when they're all kind of meeting each other for the first time and the second timeline where they're at their 10 year reunion. Except at the 10 year reunion, a certain someone is missing. Her name is Heather and she is killed at some point during their stay in the university. And it is assumed by that the murderer is part of her previous friend group and he decided that, that he's going to figure out what is going on and that he will discover which person in the friend group was the murderer. We actually followed the story from the perspective of Jessica Miller, who who is one of the people in the friend group. And I'm recommending this book specifically because of her romantic subplot. Again, this is heavy spoiler territory, so I can't go into it too much, but there's tea, it's sexy, it's addicting, just like this album. So I, <laughs> what else do you want me to say? That brings me to the next theme. And that theme is this idea of these sanctimonious soliloquies that certain vipers dressed in empaths clothing are yelling at her and she's not listening. <laughs> it's so funny. And you know what? I'm so glad that she said this because I feel like the parasocial relationship is very strong with this one, especially recently. And I think her telling us to shut up and kind of remember we don't know her um, was necessary, especially in hindsight with the uh, speak up now movement, which was ludicrous. Um, look, again, all of this is alleged, but assuming a lot of this album is about Mari Healy, I'm gonna stay straight up. Like, I don't, I like some of his songs. I don't like what he does at his shows, especially what he did in uh, Malaysia when he shut, but okay, like this is so above me, like what do I know? What what does my opinion even matter? Um, for me, my only thing is like, <laughs> when I listen to these songs, I'm kind of like, and I get reminded who they are about and I'm like, oh, he's so ugly. In my opinion, I just, I just don't find him attractive at all, at all. I have the same one listening to Supernatural by Ariana Grande. Does this affect my enjoyment of the song? No, it's just funny. 
it's not that deep but she does bring this idea up of like you guys are building me up but in reality you're just like restricting me you know and I find it interesting and she talks about this in this very veiled manner throughout the album specifically uh she tends to use this metaphor of the church she ends the album also talking about people seeing her as the new god that they're worshiping but then reminding us also that it's hell on earth to be heavenly and the fallout of all these pent-up emotions i think again i might be very wrong this is a first day thing but i think that the built up of all these emotions like the pressure that comes with being such a pop star and having like all these opinions thrown at you by people who don't know you is in who's afraid of little old me i love the salem witch trial energy that it brings and it's so visual um the image of her jumping from the gallows floating down the street like something out of a horror movie just to crush the party rip your throat out and be like who's afraid of me and the second i listened to the song i was like i know exactly what book i'm recommending and it's gonna be carrie by stephen king carrie is a really good book and uh it's if you want to get into stephen king it's a great place to start it is his first book um, and it's basically about this girl who lives in this very religious, so it kind of also ties into that, uh, household with her mother. And she's very restricted and without going into spoilers too much, she goes sicko mode by the end. Very Salem Witch Trial coded. And I think it's a great book of female rage <laughs> written by a man. <laughs> but yeah, I really highly recommend. The smallest man who ever the fifth and final lens that I'll be talking about today is the con man and the fool, which are two roles that are very interesting throughout the album. At the end of the sparkled summer and her stay as the department head of the tortured poets department, there's only one revelation Taylor wants to leave us with that she didn't mention before. Though she does hint at it in Fortnite when she says that the drug that she's taking, its effects were temporary. This person who she defended so vehemently and found so alluring turned out to be what? A con man selling a fool, a get love quick scheme. And then she calls them the smallest man who ever lived. And she has this re realization of, whoa, maybe I can't fix him. Maybe I can't. Maybe this is too broken. But then at the same time, you can really tell how hurt she feels because of this, because she was so like infatuated with him only to get disillusioned once it, all, it wasn't forbidden anymore to be honest this dude kind of sounds like a pick me guy because he's like oh, normal girls are boring and i mean hey going from i'm gonna have his babies no i'm not um to i don't even want you back i just want to know if resting my sparkling summer was the goal that's quite the u-turn and for this book i will once again recommend a classic and i'm going to recommend white nights by dostoevsky it's a very short book and it's about and it suits this academia classical imagery that we've been going we've been having going on so far and it is about a man meeting a woman and they try to aid each, aid each other in curing their love sickness but perhaps one side wasn't as truthful as the other and because of that it does have this very beautiful but also grim side to it and I think it is very thought-provoking and I think it's very beautiful and I think that because it's so short and concise it's also a very easy introduction to Dostoevsky. That's all for me. Thank you so much for watching to the end of the video. I have no clue how long it's gonna be but I have like an hour and a half of footage so I'm gonna have to cut everything down. <laughs> um, let me know what you think of this video, the tortured poets department, would you like to see a part two where I do the second album kind of also are you supposed to call this ts12 because like i'm not sure um i'd love to know i'll see you next time bye